This conference will now be recorded. Cool. Thank you. You can oh, see the right there. Oh, no. Yeah. We're in the crowd. Here. I'm going to give it a minute. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today we are joined by Kate Morris of the Copper River Watershed Project and Ewan Angus of Dowell, and he's online. So uh, he'll hop on about halfway through the presentation. When I'm ready for him. <laughs> and I'll pass it over to Kate. Thank you. Great. Well, I told the, the early tummers that I know that cabaret was tonight. I'm not going to make up for the song and dance here, um, but appreciate that you chose to come to hear an update on our EF Lake Weir project. Um, I'm the program director, Kate Morris, with the Copper River Watershed Project. Um, and tonight, I'm just going to make sure we're all on the same page. Some of you have been part of every conversation I've had about this project, and some of you, um, this you might be newer. Um, to the history, and so I'm just going to start with a recap of how we got to where we are today with this project. Uh, then we'll hear from Ewan, um, who's our lead water resource engineer at Dow, who's working with a team over there. Um, and the last time I was here, I think it was about February last year, and Ewan was here in person, um, and we were giving an update on the 20% design. And so you're going to hear from him all that's happened since that um, last meeting, which is a lot. Um, and then lastly, we are going to pull out the hot potato and we're going to play a game and uh, talk a little bit about some of the current challenges that we're facing. But even today, there might be some new updates that I, I haven't received yet, so it's not all bad news. So that's the map of our evening. Uh, which way do I make it go? Well, that's the pointer. Uh, the arrow. The arrow? Yep. What do I point out? Point at the computer. Okay. So, quick background. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Copper River Watershed Project, we're a nonprofit. That's, uh, our headquarters is here in town. We're super excited that we officially have full time year round staff also on the ground in the Copper Basin. Um, and we are, our mission is to support an impact watershed um, with. Uh, using partnerships as our, our key mechanism. There's not any one entity that owns the land that fills this whole drainage area, which um, supports the anadromous life cycle of a salmon that starts in freshwater after the ocean back again. Um, I'm going to assume that a lot of us are familiar with that, so go over that a little bit faster this evening. Um, but tonight we are uh, going to highlight the partnership. Will it work for me? If I point at you <laughs> with the clicker, we'll get the clicker real quick. Yeah. Um, about EF Lake. So uh, the big thing I want to emphasize is this is not the Copper River Watersheds project. Project, project. <laughs> this is Cordova's project. This is all of these partners who have been at the table. Um, we are, uh, our expertise is in herding cats and asking hard questions, um, but to tackle this, um, the challenge of upgrading EF Lake Weir is taking a lot of different people, a lot of different expertise, um, a lot of different, a lot of resources, <laughs> um, and it is something that, you know, we saw a need, we have expertise to be able to bring partners together, to be able to pursue funding, 
And so that's why I'm here talking to you, but I just want to make sure it is not just our project, it is all our collective our project. Um, so this is a, a pre-earthquake photo of when it was just a railway and the river and the lake were just one water level. <laughs> Um, and then earthquake of 64 happened. We saw um, big uplift in this area. And um, you can go ahead and um, go to the next page. Uh, and then with that change in the te uh, tectonics, um, we started to see a, a lowering of the lake levels. And so it took a Google research uh, to track down a legal case during the construction of the weir. So we were able to identify that it was overseen by the state of Alaska. Unfortunately, by a department that no longer exists. And then um, using the year of this legal case when construction occurred, we were able, to, I started the Cordova time search and blew my mind that less than nine months before it was constructed, the idea was agreed upon by the community. So January 72, city manager and the community had a discussion, made a case to the governor, and by September it was installed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was, uh, so I'm not sure about the permitting, but uh, a lot happened pretty quickly and I think, um, you know, things were quite a bit different back then. Um, so that's why it's there. But again, the State Department that oversaw its construction no longer exists. Um, and there's been many difficulties with finding the appropriate partner or permission to be able to do any maintenance. So it's largely been unmaintained. Um, and it, we we're interested in addressing it before it fails. And so um, we were able to start pursuing funding through the Exxon Valdez Oil School Trustee Council. And that's where we got our first boost. Well, I shouldn't say that. We back up a step. Let's go to the next project. Um, I'll get through the timeline. So um, the main resources behind this project have been Fish Passage, but I'll talk a little bit more about the benefits beyond Fish Passage. Um, but the reality is our, our wheel, wheel is failing. So you can see this is what we call the bulge here. This is the original alignment. So it's spilling over. Um, there are more and more you're starting to see little seams busting out. And so there's a lowering of the lake happen, happening. Um, yeah, the lake is on average about 10 feet deep. So it's not a very, there's not a lot of catchment to be able to contain a lot of water. And so if there were not a weir holding up the lake levels, we would see a mud flat. Well, it's Hartney Bay. We were discussing. We should put a picture of Hartney Bay in here, perhaps, to so visualize it. Um, it's not. You know, we're not thinking that there's going to be a catastrophic failure, but there's going to be continued deterioration and failure of this over time. Um, and so, at the time, the weir was installed to maintain and protect near shore spawning beds for sockeye. So maintain the lake levels, keep those spawning beds underground. Um, so that was in the 70s. And then since the 70s, we've continued to fine tune and learn a lot more about fish and fisheries and life cycles and important life stages. And so the connectivity um, between habitats for the juvenile fish um, has become a very high priority. It's the reason behind the work of the culverts that we've been replacing out in the Delta. Um, and so you have juvenile fish species, sockeye salmon, coho salmon, they're going to live in fresh water for multiple years. They're not just hatch, emerge, and then migrate to the ocean. And so to be able to move to maximize access to food, to avoid either too warm conditions or places that freeze in entirety in the winter, you know, being able to um, maximize their growth, the bigger the buffet, the more that you can feed. Um, so the idea is that we want to have this connectivity between these freshwater habitats so these juvenile fish can have a larger nursery in which to rear. We definitely want to also get the, the adults up to their spawning grounds, but we are seeing the, the adults movement um, so our plan, um, let me just pause here for a second. Um, we'll go to the next slide and then we'll talk more about the plan here. Um, so the, the main, the main goal uh, was to improve the pass passage of juvenile fish between the lake and river at all flows and to maintain the lake levels for the funding. It's driven by habitat. So that's for keeping our near shore stock spawning underwater, their spawning beds underwater. Um, but yeah, Lake, Lake is a backup water supply for our city, and we have infrastructure that requires water at a certain depth to be able to draw that water. Um, there will be an interesting um, issue with uh, property boundaries and um, what would happen if, if the lake were to recede uh, without the, the weir backing it up. 
Um, and then there's other uses that are being compromised. Um, there are boaters that pass up and down of the weir that, um, you know, so this, the slat by the bulge was originally intended for boats to pass. And Chris can tell you all about objects, point, pointy objects in, in dangerous places that are currently there. Um, so we are going to be able to make the boat passage safer. We're not going to increase the times that you can pass by boat. And it's not always possible. I mean, maybe if you're Chris, it's possible to get up and over the weir and all water levels. But <laughs> um, so we're not going to like improve the boat passage, but we will be able to maintain boat passage um, at, at most water levels. Um, and then there was, have been interest expressed for trying to improve fisheries monitoring. Um, the value, the ex vessel value that Fishing Game calculates on EF Lake runs is between two and three million dollars from the fishery locally. Um, so there's an interest in actually improving the escapement data and the monitoring of these populations. And so this we are to provide an opportunity to do that. Um, and then there's Recreational fishing that occurs near the site, and so making making it safer was um, also an interest, but is not the primary goal of this project because you can't do everything. <laughs> um, so, all having all of these goals um, makes it challenging. Um, the other thing is we again don't have an owner, and so we don't have anybody that is going to want to take a high maintenance project on. So we have done um, what we, meaning Dow, has done everything they can to come up with a strategy that is as low maintenance as possible. Um, and then we are literally between a rock and a hard place. So like we've got rock cliffs here and a giant lake here. Um, so the constructability and finding something and some way to work in this environment that's very close to highway bridge that's connecting key resources like our airport, our welding businesses for our commercial fishery. Like there's just, you know, a lot of um, tricky things about this site. Um, and then just making sure that we're not causing the outcome doesn't increase uh, flooding for our lake residents or um, downriver flood events for our river residents. Um, there's also this bridge is on the schedule uh, with DOT to be replaced. And so we're also trying to you know, avoid having all of this happening at once. Um, and so there's a lot of challenges, but I just want to emphasize that like that's all the more reason that we are trying to be proactive and using this time to collect the data, to um, co connect with the experts, the local experts in the community. Um, you'll hear more about our outreach that we've been doing over the past few years, um, because if it were to fail, we would have a band-aid fix and it would be a quick fix and we wouldn't have all that time to put into it. And so even though it's hard and there are hard things to work through, it is um, really important. Um, so I'm going to talk about the timeline of, um, of the project. And uh, we started back in 2020 with uh, the Forest Service was able to put forward some funding um, that we were, uh, the Watership Project was able to leverage some from DOT, which made it non-federal match so that we could then um, get funding from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And so there's a lot of game of like leveraging a little bit of our money so that we could do the preliminary investigations, get our site survey, get a drill rig to evaluate the subsurface materials. Um, and then we were trying to get all of this, the Exxon Valley's Oil Spill Trustee Council put out a call for proposals in March and we had to submit one, or we, no, we had to submit it by March, and then we had to submit a final proposal by August. And so you know between March and August is a very calm time with nothing happening around here. Uh, so we were busy, you all were busy, it's summertime, um, and we were able to get through all those preliminary investigations, get an h and report, which is our looking at all of the precipitation and the rain events and the movement of water through the landscape and through the lake, through the river. Um, and, and start looking at different alternatives. What would be the best option to start pursuing um, for some design considerations? Uh, got some feedback, submitted a proposal to the trustee council, and in that said, we don't know who owns it yet, and we don't have that figured out, but we have a partnership, and we have letters of support from a ton of agencies that were all willing to figure it out, as long as just give us the funding, <laughs> and we got it. So that got us going in our uh, design phase, and um, typically when we do designs, whether it's for Colbert and for the Weir, we usually start with, um, with what we call 15% design. So this is just like your first sketch on the paper, and then have uh, convene our partners to be able to talk about that. And when we had our 15% design, we had some partners who were like, this isn't achieving the goals that we want for Fish Passage. 
And usually we get to what we call our 65% design, and that's where you've taken that 15% design and made it like even better. But we wanted to do something different. So then we added a 20% design check so that we could try something different and see that before we took the idea further. And that is what we presented last January. And so you'll hear a lot more about it, but just a little bit of a teaser. Um, the, it was, the design is called a Rocky Ramp. And the idea is that we're maintain, we're gonna install a new weir structure that has a crest like at a similar level. And then we're gonna take that, that river bottom and make it into a Rocky Ramp with fill um, that is engineered to have different pathways, which I'll let you and do all of that talking. Um, but then this way, there's better connectivity. You're not going to have that like dam effect at low waters. Um, and so that idea gained traction. Um, it also got a lot more expensive. Um, but then we have this partnership, we have this momentum, and then we get the bipartisan infrastructure law that has so much money for fish passage. And so uh, Cordova, um, has benefited, the Copper River has benefited from this infrastructure bill. Um, and so with our partnership with the EAC Corporation, um, they submitted an application on behalf of our partnership. Um, and we got another three and a half million from the Federal Highway Administration to be able to get us closer to the estimated construction cost um, so that we can actually fund and build this. So we have a design that's moving along with broad support and uh, low maintenance, um, minimal impacts to um, like unintended impacts, which I'll let you and talk about all the work that they did to ensure how uh, low maintenance and how it would act, how, uh, how we were hoping it will at different flows of water, um, but we still don't have an owner. Um, and so right now, if you want to go to the next slide, we are in, um, this is breaking out that design timeline, sorry. So we. Started with, we had our 20% design that we talked about last year. Um, we just reviewed the 65% submittal, and that's what you're going to hear more about. Um, and the goal is that we can wrap this up and go to bid this summer. Um, and then our construction window is driven by the fish behavior and the lake levels. Um, so we can't, we're trying to avoid when adults are spawning, when um, small are out migrating. Um, when the waters are pouring from the skies in the fall. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're trying to avoid. And so our construction window is likely to be like January through April um, when the water is the lowest. Who knows what else could happen during that time frame, but that's just the, the gamble that we have to take doing work uh, around Cordova. Um, so I think with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Ewan um, because he knows a lot more about it than I do. So, Ewan, are you there? Oh, can you guys hear me? Yes. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. Oh, that's a yes. Lovely. Thanks, Kate. As Kate mentioned, I'm Ewan and I'm the lead design engineer for the project. So, my goal for today is for you to leave here knowing the following. So, what factors go in that inform the and constrain the design of the weir. What we've done in the last year or so since we last presented to you. What we want to we want to show what we've done that that we've done our homework and we want to take you through the design process, and then show you the likely impacts of implementing the project. Now, the one thing I will kind of preface this with is that there's a lot of information here, and I I've lived and breathed this project over the last three years. So if there's a piece missing or you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, either I'm not too sure whether there's a kind of a Q&A session at the end or even after when you're driving home. It always happens to me when it's like, ah, oh, should have asked that question. Please let us know. Uh, one thing I want everyone like in the room and in the community to feel as comfortable with what we're proposing here. Uh, Christina, could you go to the next up, please? Thank you. So with any project, there are constraints and boundaries that we need to work within. For the WEIR project, the most important constraints that we that have guided the study and design are as follows. We want to maintain the existing range of the water levels in the WEIR and match the amount of water leaving the lake into the Yak River. And these are linked, and this is one of the reasons why we've done so much data collection over the last couple of years. 
Uh, the next is to protect utilities and infrastructure, both upstream and downstream of the weir. Essentially, we we don't want to impact the bridge and we don't want to cut power or communications to the six mile residents in the airport. That is very important, as you'd imagine. Uh, we need to take account of the seismicity of the area and the soil properties. So, just now the existing weir sits on soils that are liable for liquefaction. So we've designed the weir to withstand a, a design earthquake. And then the last one is that the weir is located in a FEMA floodplain. So we want to take account of any changes in water level in those areas. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, with that in mind to frame our approach, I'll explain what we've done over the last year. Now, you know that you guys have seen me about town, town but this is me in the picture. Uh, I've probably been in EAC late so much, I've become uh, Cordova's equivalent of the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, what we've done in the last year is collected a lot of data, especially in 2023, and that includes water levels in EAC Lake and EAC River. The discharge of the system, so that's the amount of water flowing from EAC Lake into EAC River and then how fast the water travels between the two. With that data, uh, it allows us to accurately characterise how the lake and the weir uh, and the river acts over a wide range of flows. Now in turn, we use this data to create a 2D hydraulic model that represents the existing conditions. With that, uh, we can uh, start building on that as a design tool to look at the uh, design of the weir. Uh, the other things that have happened within the last year is that permitting has been started. So Copper River Watershed Project is leading this effort and this is mostly to keep the kind of permitters involved about the design process and so that everyone is in the loop and they've done an awesome job of that. There's there's no kind of surprises expected there. Uh, and then the last last thing that I kind of closed out the year for us was uh, from the end of the open water se uh, season, after we collected the bulk of our data, we worked on making that 20% design concept that we presented last time we were down there a viable design. Uh, and this is fairly, you know, kind of tricky, but uh, we wanted to make sure that those sketches that we had in paper meets the, the design criteria and constraints. Okay, next slide, please. So before I dive into the kind of design process, I want to show you where we're collecting some of our data just to give you some context. Uh, we've got equipment above and below the weir that measures the water depth and velocity. Now this is really important for us to kind of validate our models, but also allows us to see when the weir is completely inundated with water. And that, that's kind of important for design, but uh, it's it was very handy having that data, especially over uh, that kind of long period of uh, 2023 and that a really kind of uh, high sampling rate. So every 15 minutes we were taking a uh, water level in the, the lake and just downstream of the weir. Uh, we also have equipment further downstream on Eak River and this again measures depth and velocity and this is where we'd measure how much uh, water was flowing through the system. So if you were ever on the boat ramp throughout last year and you seen someone in uh, high visibility yellow, that would have been me. Okay, next slide please. So, uh, with the design constraints and data uh, collection kind of explainers fresh in our mind, I want to quickly take you through uh, how we approach designing the weir and kind of take that from a concept to a viable solution. What we've talked about so far covers that those first two steps where we are recording what's going on at the weir and uh, how we want to how we use it to describe the existing conditions. The next part is where it gets really fun for me. Uh, this is where I get to design the weir and model it in a 2D hydraulic model. Uh, so first off, we'd start off with that sketch, chuck it in the model, and see how. It uh, see how the model behaves and how the lake level responds and how uh, the river responds. Once the model is run, I check those results against design constraints in the existing conditions. 
And three important, three of the kind of important checks include: Do we match existing water levels in the lake? Do we have enough water depth in the ramp? And do we have low enough velocities in the ramp uh, for fish passage? And if we don't have those conditions, then I look back to changing those design parameters. And then for a weir, the important things we change are the, the height of the weir, the length of the weir crest, and then the grading of the channel. So I would iteratively change those uh, uh, parameters to kind of to suit the the modeling results as as we kind of progress. So I would iterate through those and then check them against the uh, existing conditions, and we'll keep adjusting that until we get a workable design that meets the requirements. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the kind of a short break for me talking, uh, and what you'll see here is the output of our existing uh, 3D hydraulic model. So you'll see the existing ray here with water flowing over it, and the range of blue colours that you see in the channel indicate depth. This is for the flow scenario that's approximately 500 cubic feet per second, which is just below the average flow for the EAC. So this is uh, what uh, we use as our baseline. And we have many other uh, flow scenarios that we model from the trickle that you see run about mid-February, early March of about 100 CFS right up to uh, 2,000, 3,000 CFS. So we've got, we model a wide range of uh, flows within this uh, 2D model. Oh. Uh, thank you. So here we see the overview of the 65% weir design. Now this is this will be familiar to you. Uh, it's essentially a kind of a, a more detailed twenty percent design where we have a a low flow channel for fish passage just uh, on the kind of right hand side of the screen. Uh, we've got rocky banks on the side of the channel and a central portion of the ramp free of obstacles to accommodate boat passage. While it may be hard to imagine looking at the kind of black and white line drawing that we've got here of the proposed weir, it will uh, resemble a natural channel with the weir structure not really being visible at all. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the things we uh, do to kind of accommodate this kind of new design is to change the weir length and height, and uh, that allows us to kind of go through the design process to meet the design requirements. And the, ne the next slide is a good example of this. Uh, here we've got an outline of where the new sheet pile kind of structure will go compared to the existing weir. You can see the length of the weir has increased and the geometry has been modified uh, during that design process. So I'll give you a couple of seconds here just to kind of to look at the changes uh, before we move on. So on the next slide, uh, we have on the left, uh, we've got a plan view showing the existing weir and an elevation view showing the existing crest elevation in black. Now on that, superimposed in red is the alignment and elevation of the proposed weir. And while the length and geometry of the weir will be changing, the height of the weir will mostly remain the same. Uh, the biggest change for the height of the weir is fixed in that failed boat notch section of the bulges, uh, as Kate has kind of pointed out before, uh, and then allowing for a uh, kind of a small notch for the low flow uh, fish passage. On the right, we have the 65% plans, uh, and what I want to show you here is a cross section of the weir. Uh, this is as if we sliced in the centre of the weir to look at the side on. And that's in the lower right-hand corner. 
Uh, we're creating a ramp that will allow the water to flow over the weir like a natural channel rather than spilling over. Uh, and that's what we're, that's one of the sections from the design drawings. And the large black dots you see in there on the cross section are kind of bands of rock that are going to try and uh, keep the channel material in place. So once it's uh, constructed, uh, we are anticipating that the uh, stream material that we've placed will not uh, be moving under significant flows. Yeah, next slide, please. So we're back to video again. That was a lot of information, so another bit of a break. And this one is uh, this video is the proposed structure from the two D hydraulic model. So to compare apples to apples, we this is the same flow scenario as we did before. So just below the average flow, you'll see on the EAC and your normal conditions, which is about 500 CFS or cubic feet per second. Uh, the scale on the right indicates the depth uh, depth for flows that are uh, below average. So that, uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. The scale that you'll see on the uh, right hand side indicates the depth and it uh, appears that we're getting approximately one foot depth down the ramp during uh, average flows. And that, of course, as the flows increase, uh, we'll get uh, a deeper uh, flow depth. Hello, thank you. So I think the, uh, the last remaining question to be answered is what impact will the proposed we have on the lake? Uh, to show the changes, I'll outline the existing lake level data that we have and then show the changes in the next slide. But the graph we have on screen here shows the lake level on the y-axis and the discharge or the, or the flow going out of the lake on the x-axis. The colourful bars that stretch across the graph show the high, low and average water levels for Eak Lake. Now there's two sources of information here. One was the, uh, a 1970 survey that estimated the pre-earthquake water levels, uh, both for mean high water and mean low water. And then the other is data from the National Weather Service gauge on Eak Lake that's been averaged over the years it's been in service. Uh, and then the last remaining item on there is the grey dots you'll see across the graph, and these represent the water level in the lake for a given flow scenario. So that, this, that's the data that we collected throughout last year. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, there, Christina? So, uh, this slide shows the results of the modelling of the proposed weird in orange. Overall, there is a very small rise that occurs uh, over the model flow scenarios, and this averages to approximately two inches uh, in change. For context, that's about the length of the average dump. Uh, uh, the largest rise that occurs is about 3.8 inches, and that's the lowest flows. So the trickle that you'll see at the uh, in late February, early March, and that's a result of fixing that broken sheet pile that has bulged. So by create by moving that kind of uh, vertically, we are we're going to naturally raise the the water level. So based on the iterative design process, this is as close as we can get to the existing water level while meeting the design objectives and also not uh, no, kind of creating a a huge budget for the project or going outside of the project area. And this rise overall is uh, attributed to the change of the how the water flows out of the EAC. So rather than spilling over that thin kind of crested weir, now it flows over a rocky ramp uh, and kind of slows the, the water as it exits. So uh, naturally that will be uh, have an effect on how the discharge leaving the lake. But uh, what we've done is to change the overall geometry of the weir uh, to try and mitigate that. So now uh, I'll pass it back to Kate uh, to, wrap, to wrap up. <laughs>
Um, we can pause actually, maybe to see are there questions about the design that we want to revisit or clarify? Because there was just a lot of information, and this is the first time I'm like, okay, yeah, it's making sense, and I hear him talk it all the time. So Bill. It looks like the, kind of the ramp part is just in the center, is that correct? It's a river wide ramp. It's just um, engineered in certain areas on this right side to have like at low flows to make sure that there's like that's when you have a trickle that can be shallow and swift. And so you want to have resting places and maintain enough depth for passage of fish at those flows. And so that's this is like a little bit more engineered to like to provide that low flow channel essentially over the weir. And then it's not it's like it's mimicked with rocks that are not going to be placed this perfectly spaced to have it roughened on that side too. And then in here is not roughened, but it's still a ramp. And so that's why the velocity is different in the middle of it. That just allows because I, what I, he was describing at the end as far as like getting the water levels to maintain um, the this is adding fill so it's like putting ice cubes near glass and it fills over um, but then it's also creating friction for the water that's leaving and so there's, there's less friction in the middle of the channel so it can allow the higher flows so it's that right hand side that's projected to be the, the fish. low water level fish yeah. transit zone is that right Ewan did I say that right <laughs> yep. I'm sure. <laughs> yes, thank you. yeah so what holds a rock in there when it's at flood stage? They're embedded, like the, like the rocks are all of a certain size and have uh, spe specifications that how much are buried under. And then you and there's also concrete, can, or can you describe the ways that you've designed the uh, material to stay place, stay in place? Of course, yeah. So the material is designed to uh, can stay in place with the highest velocities that we're expecting and that's where the modeling really came in handy where we could uh, run the models and see how what's the kind of maximum velocity that we'd expect so we designed the the majority of the material and the and the ramp to stay put during that high flow uh, scenario or the high velocity scenario but we've added those kind of uh, lines of rock those kind of contours of rock going up the ramp to as a kind of a safety kind of net to make sure that material really doesn't um, move so those are kind of great control structures that really kind of enforce that uh, those kind of elevations on the ramp the one thing that is interesting about EAC uh, that you've probably seen while you've uh, been out out there during high high water events is that the water from EAC river uh, rises and backs up over the weir. During those uh, scenarios uh, and through our kind of, uh, data collection, we we recorded that velocities uh, slow as uh, when the water goes above the weir. So the, the worst case scenario for velocities is between kind of a high flow event where you see water being backed up over the weir and average. So it's, it's quite unique for uh, uh, some river systems where usually the high flow velocities, as as you kind of noted, are in the kind of flood stages. But for this, <laughs> during flooding, the velocities aren't too aren't too high because it's backwatered and it's almost choked further downstream. So uh, we've had to look at uh, the velocities in between those uh, events to size that material. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, Colin. Do you anticipate, or is it part of the plan, to like armor anything else, like downstream or even upstream from it? Because if you change the flow a little bit, do you do you see like, especially around a bridge, if you go to the the second graphic or the second model? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, that was that the Yeah. Right there. That's the one there. If you run that, there's like an eddy that's created. Yeah. Is there any like requirement or anything like, oh, well, we might have, you know, the flow may push over here and make something vulnerable or something? Are there requirements like, oh, we got to reinforce this side and that side? And... Yeah, so the 
bioengineering of the banks are definitely a part of the design discussion. And I would actually be keen to, I, I bet it's possible that that already exists in the other uh, model as well. Um, the part of that was the reason that the, um, the new alignment of the weir was created because using the existing alignment, um, you could the last traffic hat, or the first model in the existing conditions it just hits every the the water is forced over here and you can see that now like there's a huge gravel bar that uh, or like it gets shallower on this mm -hmm. side because the velocity is moving things over there so there will be um I, the velocity i mean you and i may have to let you talk but like based on my <laughs> my understanding of our discussions is that there is actually like we we some of the earlier discussions over armored the banks and folks were like that's too much like this isn't very high velocity we're not worried about downstream erosion but it is so it is definitely like it is something um that we were are aware of and have different techniques to help um buffer and protect the banks but it's not anticipated that like root wads the comp was what we started with and people are like that's too much it's overkill <laughs> we don't need all of that Ewan, did you want to add anything about the banks and uh, protection yeah. downstream? So, so uh, our 2D model uh, goes all the way down to the boat ramp. Uh, and what uh, we're seeing here, thanks for uh, playing it again, is the particle tracking. So while uh, we do see kind of eddies form just below the bridge and flow being more aligned through the uh, bridge opening, uh, what's not shown here is the velocities, uh, and as Kate mentioned, the velocities are really quite low at that point. So there's a change in velocities uh, along the ramp because the, that's where the most of the changes. But uh, downstream of the bridge and at the, the bridge, uh, there's very little change in the existing velocities. Now, as a matter of process, uh, we would check uh, the velocities before and after, uh, all the way down. Uh, to the extent of our models again just to make sure just we are being very careful and not causing a an unintended erosion scenario or uh, anything like that so yeah that's something we've considered and as our partnership that mainly has done culverts at this point um definitely does a lot of adaptive management keeps eyes on the ground um checking out conditions we just had a conversation about the like Bridge that was just we helped finish this fall in the little Tonsina River that we anticipate we are going to go back and bioengineer. We're going to wait a year to see how all flows, um, how things adjust, and then make a plan to go in and reinforce areas. But once you reinforce an area, then you're also just directing it somewhere else. And so you kind of need to give the system time to stabilize in its new formation. There's definitely more time for questions, but I just knew I wanted to pause before we move away from the design. Are there any? Yeah, Danny. Um, do you anticipate issues working in that time frame with ice on the lake? You know, are, are you? Are... So we uh, we've had a lot of conversations with uh, James Dundas, who conveniently is a neighbor, and um, we had cameras out last winter, I don't think we had them out this winter, but they, the, the weir rarely ices up to the weir, um, or the lake rarely ices yeah. up the whole way to the weir. And his local knowledge has has confirmed, like that's his state statement, and then our you know collecting images didn't show any differently. So the area within where you'd be using equipment should be okay. Should be ice <laughs> I mean, this is Cardova. I, I know anything's possible. Oh, passage? Yes. Straight up the middle. I believe that's the vision, Ewan. Yep. Anywhere there's not rocks or where you not, don't want to take your boat, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this, this is like, um, so I, is it like 526 cubic feet per second is like the average flow. This model is 500 cubic feet per second and it's uh, estimated a foot deep. And I remember at our voters group that everyone's like six inches that's all we need so we were like doubled it <laughs> but it's pretty big rock as well right 
there's big rocks that are good on the both sides. I mean, it's in theory, there's not going to be big rocks tumbling from Eak Lake down into the weir. So what's in that part is a uh, smoother, not I mean, not a smooth surface, but right, it's still ramped to the the center of the channel, isn't it? Or is it? Um, so is there a cross section? How deep is it? Relatively, or are you basically leaving an unmodified channel in this? You and I'm going to let you answer that. So I think I heard the 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 question as a uh, is the center of the ramp uh, not got uh, rocks in it, and what's the kind of average depth? Is that correct? I couldn't quite make it the whole question. Yeah, you know, because I was, you know, listening to the fish, the modification for fish passage, which may gave me the impression that there were some rocks and other things in there for um, that purpose. Uh, yes, there is. So, me, uh, Christina, if you could go to slide, say, uh, 28 or 29. I know this is jumping ahead, but it's, it's just another type of graphic we've got on board there. Uh, is it this one? Lovely. Yes, that, that's 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 a good example of. Uh, so this is a slightly higher flow, uh, and you can see that kind of. Uh, slightly darker blue channel going from the crests uh, with the rocks in it uh, and going down the right side of the image. So that is the low flow channel for uh, fish passage and it's just slightly deeper, so about half a foot deeper than the rest of the ramp. But between that and the rocks on the right hand side, uh, it's kind of clear of kind of large obstructions. So while that small kind of channel towards the right is slightly deeper and will convey some more flow during lower periods, a uh, majority of the water will be flowing through that center of the channel. And I can show you the cross section. Um, uh, I, but, I see okay. it there. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, do that. Colin? Uh, what's it going to be made of? Like sheet pile? Is it going to be a sheet pile wall? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So the the primary structure is going to be a sheet pile driven to the required depth, and that's approximately twenty five to thirty feet deep. To, and that's mainly to kind of mitigate that the risk from earthquakes. And at the top of the sheet pile, just to kind of stiffen the structure, we're going to have a, essentially a concrete beam cast in place along the top, and then backfilled. So the only thing you'll end up seeing is the kind of a nice natural rocky ramp, but uh, Beneath that, you'll have uh, approximately 30 feet of sheet pile and then a concrete uh, beam along the top of the sheet pile. So, Kate, if I understand correctly, then there's a concrete beam at the top of the sheet pile. Mm -hmm. Is that wide enough? Is it going to be uh, more for people to walk over? No, I think the, is the concrete beam underneath rocks as well? Uh, it, sh it should be. I mean, uh, sorry, Christina, for making you go back and forth, but on slide 19 is probably a good uh, diagram to show. Uh, the other way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, no, uh, Christina had it uh, right the first time on slide 19, please. Which one is that? Sorry, I might have messed it up. Oh, you know what? I got it down here. Okay, sorry. No, you're fine. You know, all the fishermen are going to be walking that. You know, it's, hey, look, they made it nice and shallow. It's easy to get out there. Oh, they made little pools for the fish to be in. Yeah. And the fish are going to be like, I'm out of here because I can swim through and I'm not stuck. <laughs> so, when that. So on the 
the graphic that's on the right hand side on the uh, on this lower half you can see the cross section of the weir uh, between the the at, the at the very top of the ramp you can see kind of a, a small rectangle uh, between uh, the rip ramp upstream and then the rocky ramp downstream so that is the uh, concrete crest there so you'll barely see the top of it it wouldn't be too convenient to walk across because we've tried to make that as thin as possible uh, and it's approximately between one and two feet wide but because flow is flowing over it it's you'd be as it'd, it'd be as easy to walk anywhere else on the on the ramp not that, that we encourage it but uh, that's uh, an option if you so wish Yeah, please. So with winter uh, construction, are they going to, what about like the swans and stuff that live right there all winter? Is there going to be mitigation measures for that or I just move up? Not the river ice? Uh, I mean, I think there's likely to avoid activity right at the weir. I mean, I will, it's, it's not like it's not thought of, I guess I just, we're not there yet. So I just haven't thought that far ahead, but. We will, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that like, before there's not usually, like if the ice doesn't go the whole way to the weir, we can't, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know <laughs> what else we can, when else we could, so we'll, we'll have to work in conjunction with the swans to share the space. To hire bird, bird feeders to feed them elsewhere. Yeah. Downstream. We'll send them out to Orca. <laughs> Well, I know everybody wants to play a little round of hot potatoes, so um, where are those slides again? So we can go back well, to here. So, Kate, so you yeah. never really answered, like, who owned the weir? You just told us in the beginning of the history, like, who put it there? That's my question, Gail. I, who owns the weir? <laughs> it's not answered yet. And so that's... Um, that was my real motivation about giving a community presentation was I, I almost loaded the truck with pitchforks so that we could go because as Cordovans, like we have the so most yeah, to lose. So who's permission, who gave you permission to do this? Nobody is, has permission to grant. Um, I can tell more of the story, but go ahead, Barry. Well, I, my thinking based on what you said in the very beginning, it would seem that the city and the fishermen mm -hmm. um, are the ones that uh, essentially, through power of eminent domain, even though they didn't call it that, went out and did it. And maybe that's what the city needs to do this time is, you know, so that you have ownership. Is so it was the state, domain. not the city. It was the city manager who called the meeting, but it was the state of Alaska who oversaw the contract. But the problem is it's the state of Alaska division of Waters, harbors, and water. public works. Yeah. And so they don't exist anymore. Um, DOT has taken on a bit of the uh, of projects that that agency had, but DOT's mandate is transportation, and we keep Alaska moving. And this is not moving any Alaskans anywhere. This is a water level grade control. Well, actually, it could be because if we lose the, the, the resource, we could be moving a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of Alaskans away, yeah. Um, so my next, the next slide, I think, is, oh, you can fix it. Look at that. So this is a, from 1979, the seven years after the weir was uh, built. This project could be likened to somebody being passed a fine item of potato <laughs> fresh from the oven. Most everyone wants a taste of it, but it's too good, too gold darn, gold, gold darn hot to handle. Of course, we had hot pads, there'd be no problem handling the potato things. Hot pads cost money. <laughs> and so, like, I had actually talked to our partnership at our last review meeting, being like, all right, I feel like we're playing a game of hot potato. And then we left to be, like, I was basically like, well, like, well, humans, one is like, we've got one month to figure out who owns it if we're going to try to construct it next year, because we need to have ownership defined for permits to be awarded. And so, um, I basically was like, okay, well, we'll just sit here until someone like helps and says that they're going to help us because like the small nonprofit with uh, with no lawyer and legal staff or um, solicitors in our team 
um, fortunately work with agencies that have those kinds of resources. Um, and it was finally uh, Megan Marie, who from Fish and Game, we'll have to give her a little shout out, who was willing to um, start the process of um, working with us to fine tune a, a memo that we then she tried to take into Fish and Game. We tried to get into DNR. We sent to DOT. But bottom up doesn't really work in Alaska very well. And so um, last week when we were meeting on site, um, one part that we haven't mentioned, but um, I think you had mentioned it briefly as part of the design constraints, but there are a lot of utilities that pass right through this site as well. So making sure that the high speed cable that we're all going to be enjoying and our, our, our airport has electricity, like those things are definitely important. And so we met on site with all of our utility partners um, and have a Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service um, all taking, and the EAC Corporation taking our memo that includes references like this, um, as well as all the times that different agencies were approached, state agencies were approached to do something about it um, to try to gain some traction. Um, and then we started going to the top down. And so um, originally we were planning on maybe like having a call to action so that we could be contacting our legislature, legislators. Um, but it didn't take much to get uh, Representative Louise Stutes on it. Um, yesterday she met with the Commissioner of Fish and Game. Today she met with Commissioner of DNR and DOT. Um, so fingers are crossed that the call to action is to please reach out and thanks Louise Stutes for her work to, to move this along. But um, we are working from top down, bottom up, um, to, to try to get the state to identify who owns it. And it was useful to talk to somebody like Clay Copeland, who was our mayor and has spent a lot of time connected in these politics um, because he's like, this is a no brainer. Like Cordova has a reputation for coming with solutions. And here we are coming with a complaint that has, you know, all a full, almost full, like a fully paid for design, has the construction funding in hand, and has agencies like Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and the Forest Service willing to pay for the maintenance. We just need somebody to like put their name on it that they will own it. So we need the hero, is what we're trying to reframe this issue. Um, so I, oh, that's right, I have the power again. Um, so we did start drafting some like talking points and comments and letters that people could sign on. I'll be going to the city council meeting um, to talk to our city councilors and to talk with um, staff at the city just about like, I mean, pretty much the state and the city are whose phones are going to be ringing off the hook if something like if the weir continues to drain water when there is, you know, a decline in the fisheries productivity of EAC Lake when our drinking water infrastructure no longer reaches the water or when our our neighbors who are fortunate enough to live waterfront are no longer waterfront. There's going to be a, a lot of calls their way. And so we're just trying to, um, you know, gather the team, maybe an angry mob. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, we did, I did want to hear like, you know, some of the things that we've identified, we've talked about tonight that, you know, we've got vital fisheries habitat, we've got a backup drinking water source, there's going to be changes to property lines, changes to navigability in the lake. Um, changes to Cordova scenery, like are there other cases that we need to make sure we're we're making as um, if we do have to put up the route, put out the rally cry. So far, everything you've said is local issues. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know it's it's not a state problem. It's well, the locals have the most to use the state problem because they put it in there, and now they're not yeah. doing anything about it. <laughs> you know, it's just like saying that, you know, the, the feds put in a road and therefore it's their responsibility because the city kept asking for it. Does the science center want to make it? <laughs> you know what? So we're, we're golden there. Um, you know, yeah, just because the city asked the state to put something in doesn't mean it belongs to the state. It was the city asked for it. Okay. You know, is and everything that you're naming is a local issue. Um, you know, I can't picture a state agency that's going to say, "Oh yeah, that's that's our our mission." Mm -hmm. um, you know, even with Fish and Game, which is the one closest. Um, yeah. You know, it's a you're you're not you're dealing with a man-made structure. 
So you're already dealing with a altered habitat. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to yell locally because that, that's how it got on built. the city council agenda coming up. So yeah. <laughs> but I've already been told by the city staff that they're everyone doesn't want it, but then why I don't, don't think they want it. <laughs> the liability of some like infrastructure that is complicated. I saw Bill Colin uh, sorry, we'll work our way across the room here. One is who owns the subsurface property? DNR. The state? DNR, yeah. Okay. And then is it considered a navigable waterway? Yeah. Yes. Or does the federal government have some sort of it's state DNR. control over that? DNR does. You now, even if it's considered a navigable waterway, doesn't it become federal? The waterway itself? UN would, I, I always thought it was um, state if it was navigable. <laughs> Yes, you're inside the limit. You're inside the three miles. Yeah, you're you're within a uh, uh, because it's under uh, ordinary high water and outside of a uh, uh, tidal influence. It would be state waters or mm -hmm. state land underneath the water. Jeez, how can the state refuse ownership? Of it? <laughs> it's state water. It's state land subsurface. Yeah. Because it's a city problem, is what Scott will tell you. Right. <laughs> it's a city problem, but still, from a good point of view, it seems like the state could not refuse ownership. The easiest state solution is to pull out the existing weir so that they don't, they're not responsible to walk away. Well, sure. I don't want to talk to you. You want to talk to me? Uh, is there an estimate of what the maintenance tail of something like this would be? I mean, I assume no maintenance has been done on the weir as it is, or maybe very little. Um, no, uh, I mean, I think under the cover of night, there has been some boulders deposited <laughs> and some uh, of the, the platform uh, moved out of the way. Um, but yeah, uh, there's not... It, there's not an annual maintenance thing on it anyway. No, so nobody's no. doing that. So. It's not like the trail committee, I know that goes on there. Yeah. 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 Years. Yeah, it's uh, you. Yes, who owns other uh, weirs like, you know, Cockle Lake and some of the other ones? And so those are temporary weirs that are a fishing game for like escapement and they get yeah. pulled at the end of the season and they put in every year. There's not, we can't find another structure like this that exists in our state. In our state you know. I mean, because I remember, I mean, when I first moved here, that, that little stand that is out there, they used to have fishing game used to have people. Um, doing counts and stuff from there. So Fish and Game must have put, at least put that point in. I think that part was for the boat passage and uh, fishing platform. It, it, they had counters out there okay. at one point. Yeah. There, <clears throat> there is the we same... A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. this, the same sheet piling that the weir consists of is also out there uh, used to protect that walkway that you're talking about. So I would imagine that it was put in at the same time. You had a question over here? Oh well, yeah, well why have you talked to the village of the village of BF and use their sovereignty to protect our public land? You know we have our land on the east end of the lake there that uh, some of our shareholders use. Uh, couldn't we use the sovereignty of MBE? So MBE has been a part of our team, and uh, you can certainly ask. And like the EI Corporation is um, is one of the stewards of the funds that we have for construction, and I can ask more specifically if there's any precedence or way to to angle on that. Um, they can use their sovereignty so that the liability problem. I just think that the state and the sovereignty aren't always it's, it's like fed, the federal recognition of sovereignty is a stronger relationship than the state's history of recognizing and the sovereignty. And so just not, doing it. The state doesn't really want it anyway. They just want to do it. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we just, it, it's not, it's not that anyone's stopping us from touching the weir. I'm just waiting for someone to tell me that we can't touch it and be like, oh, it's you who owns it. Um, but it's the the permit approval that needs to have 
the owners identified so that that's just part of the permitting process. Did Louise do say anything about state ownership? Did she have any suggestions? Or uh, I think she took the information we provided and then was like started talking with the agencies that we identified that had the nexus. So like, you know, we explained the importance for the fishery and the interest in potentially using it for fisheries monitoring so that Fish and Game had a connection or an interest. DNR being the underlying landowner until 2012, the weir was considered a dam and there's even a clause built into that that says if a dam is abandoned then it's automatically assumed by the underlying landowner who would be DNR. So we're trying that on DNR. Um, and then DOT, has an engineer that does bridge inspections and so how convenient to look both ways when you're doing your inspection to look at the bridge and the weir so there's already um you know the potential to, to have that so i don't so she i mean she met with the commissioners of those three agencies and that the most recent meeting was today and i don't know the outcome of that yet so i'm hopeful because it's definitely being pitched that like, you get to be the hero. Like you get to be the one that makes this happen without having any money invested, without having even the maintenance piece would be, you know, we have the commitment of funders and the intent or the effort into the design to make it, you know, a major earthquake would be the biggest risk to it. But if that major earthquake happened, there's gonna be a lot of issues that we're dealing with, not just a change to the weir and so, um, it's a pretty low risk thing to take on. I, I, yes, it's a little frustrating. <laughs> Are there accurate, accurate fish survey numbers for the lake that show what the population has done since the weir went in or, or say the last five or 10 years to show whether the fisheries, the, the fish population in the lake has gone up or down? And if I you would, don't know that somebody I would just like that the fishing game. Aerial surveys. Aerial surveys. Yeah. And so one of the things that we've been talking with the science center about is trying to install a conduit into the structure so that they would have what they would need to be able to deploy, I think, cameras or sonar or sonar with cameras <laughs> um, in there to be able to see and actually count what's passing over to improve the ability or to improve the data beyond the aerial surveys. But there's different types of projects that have gone on. I don't know if the Forest Service has ever done any population estimates. But. It, it just seems like from a commercial point of view, the fishery on the west side of the flats has gone down. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the water flow in the river has got a lot to do with that, but it just seems like if there were numbers to show that mm -hmm. the fishery is being affected, that that could help prod somebody into doing something too. That... Yeah, I think, I mean, my what I've learned from the culvert projects and like when it comes to like effective effectiveness monitoring the expense of doing full population counts pre and post are so extensive that they've been done and we don't need to prove it on every single crossing is the now the general consensus like I mean yeah, so we have not gone and done a preliminary baseline assessment of the population. Um, the Forest Service is leading the effectiveness monitoring, so I could, uh, Kim Clark would be the one who's leading that conversation. And I, I think, so there will be numbers that come from the evaluation of effectiveness of the project itself, but um, what it would take to do the pre-population numbers in the time that we have. Okay. Not, not on the, on and the numbers we have right now probably wouldn't be enough to. Well, we've got de spotty, decades though. of numbers, but it's just whether they're precise enough to be able to tell pre and post if there's been a change. So, 
you heard about the presentation, so we must know how to get a hold of you. But if you're not receiving emails from the Watershed Project, um, please make sure you sign in because Christina will share the sign in with us and um, we will keep you posted. Um, this presentation was recorded, um, so you can watch it again and again and share it with all your friends. <laughs> Um, but uh, we'll and also see if you answer the question. <laughs> and, the um, and we will um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch when we know if there is a call to action or a need to reach out or if, um, sign on to a letter to, to garner support. Um, the next city council meeting is April 17th and it's going to be on the agenda. So if you wanted to come and support that, I love it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any more questions. We have a lot of the, doc the ownership documentation um, and well, information that's suggesting that the state should own the, the is the owner of it here, as well as design sets and other things about um, the project. And I think you and will hang on too in case there's any small talk about design. Um, but oh, I have to I forget I have the power now. Um, we do have a. a website that has project information on it. It's where previous uh, presentation recordings are available. This one will go here. Um, if you use the QR code, it will take you to that. So you probably want to bookmark it so you can always check for the latest update on the WEIR. Um, and this is where we would put any call to action information and we'll just try to keep everything available there that we can. Um, but you can also reach me, know where to find me on Main Street here and Ewan um, doesn't get to come back every month um, but he's helping with some airport design work, so we still will see him a lot in town. And if um, he's always asking, is anyone that wants to meet with me? Is anyone wants to talk about the weir? And he's met with residents on almost every visit he's come to town, uh, usually out on the site. So want to make it accessible, available, and make sure that we're tapping into the collective expertise, because this is not the Watership Projects project. This is our collective project. So. Um, appreciate you coming out tonight and your interest in the project and um, your ideas and feedback on ownership and um, have a good rest of your evening. So, Kate, yes. is everyone throwing the potato because they don't want the liability, the maintenance, or something else? Both. I assume both. That no one wants to, to have be liable for what? If it fails? Or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for those fishermen that are trying to balance the <laughs> in their yeah. chest waders fresh yeah. off the airplane. <laughs> yeah, I um, don't. don't talk to me about it. I just get the hard no. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's still yeah. If they're worried about the fishing, mm -hmm. you know, you could just have fishing game, you know, I didn't make say that. no <laughs> fishing from the weir. You know, I mean, I mean it's like a simple solution. Yeah, like, like, that's that's where that. things can be changed. Like, yeah. the theory's changed, yeah. the regulation needs to change. And yeah. That's totally possible. Right. We're not going to, I mean, that's, well, no, I'm not, <laughs> not suggesting you do that. I want to try the pool. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for date nighting two nights or two nights. Lousy. Yeah. Lousy. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. You got an eye for it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hey, little, uh, little, uh, Did you ever get the one uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's I think that's what's good. What's working now? Uh huh. Yeah. Well, you got the S. Yeah. Well, we were.
Yeah, well, but we, I mean, like Stevens is on the list too, but then we said, like, we, but then they were like, well, we don't want to have, like, oh, I don't know. We just, since Louise was taking, like, getting traction, we were just going to sleep before we tried to get more people on it. Just, yeah. Know, we don't want anyone to get too much. Well, it's very, it's kind of the, it's kind of the, yeah. Uh, uh, Stevens of our, of our day. Yeah, really. In terms of, in terms of, it's uh, challenging to uh, decipher. I'm happy to talk to the Scottish people. Yeah. 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 In the 70s, it was on the paper. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I shut down the optics lab, it was really interesting because up through the 70s, we had all the information because it was all written down. <laughs> 80s was on Apple II discs and things like that. <laughs> and it wasn't until the late 90s that we started to recover just because we knew to change media every five years. Mm. And I still, you know, it's how many evolutions of media did have our files gone through? So, uh, you have a chance. <laughs> there you go. Say thanks for the boost. <laughs> well, when you're retired, maybe we'll send you the bell D's. See, can uh, hey, retired. It's, yeah. it's like when Steve retired, how much did he throw out? You know, it's uh, <laughs> how much, I, I bet he uh, took it all home. I backed up all yeah. spent months. Backing up stuff, yeah. Before I, wow. yeah. And actually, for the a couple of years before I retired, that was like change out tapes for backing up the network every week. Yeah. What kind of tapes? The level that tape should have been should have been. Uh, Responsibility of so it's like, okay, you guys, you have yeah, but then you just, oh, good luck. But you, <laughs> you, you, you name two things that no one ever wants it to is, say, Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll be reliable for that. Ripping out 
man-made structure to get a whole new enhanced vision. Ripping out the structure is not in this case. I know, they don't have to. We got the money to do it. Well, you said you had something that's going to maintain it, so that's the one that you're going to have to have because you have two problems, maintain and liability. And if you have someone to maintain, they're most likely to take on the okay. Why people go on the fun one? Like, imagine if it was the main reason the house would be like, right. Like, I'm going to be very, 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 Case. Their 1979 letter indicated uh, even within seven years of the installation, they were worried about maintenance. Yeah. You know, because that was, it seemed to me that's what they were dodging. Was, hey, you know, this is great, but it's not our responsibility to maintain that thing for you. Well, they were people like DOT was ready to maintain it in, in some of those correspondences, but they just didn't like they didn't want to touch it until they knew who was to give them yeah. permission to work on it. So there's no one to grant permission. And so then that's what like most of the history is. It's like, hey, we're trying this, like, we want to do this, but like, who do we ask? Who do we give permission yeah. to? Yeah. Then when you get the like, yeah. you want to cover a night or you want to. You just go out there and do it. I mean, I feel like the watershed project, as much as I like to think that will be around forever, like, you know, the state or city government is a little bit more guaranteed. But that's what makes a small organization the best. I mean, I say if it goes bad, your bank is shut down the water. Okay. And they they just look at the oil industry. That's what they're doing on the north slope. Yeah. They're, you know, all the majors are leaving and leaving it to the mid sides, and everyone knows that if there's a major fault, it's over or something. Just bankrupt, walk away. We're going to have a dance recital. So those kind of things. We'll see if anything comes up. The smaller you are, the better protected. You can't be sure. There's a big swimming issue. I know that. Yeah. I told my coworkers, oh, oh, stop. Uh, it, looks like it, look it looks tired no. than I there a couple weeks ago. Tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Good presentation. Thank Thanks you. for coming out. Have a good night. You too, okay. Chris. Who, who wrote the hot potato memo? You, you didn't show the bottom of that. Um, you and I don't have that printed out. Are you still there? He is. Hello. Yes, Hello. I'm still here. Yeah. No, I, I could. I don't have the whole memo and all the supporting documents printed out. Can you look at that fish and game memo or the from the Prince William Sound Fisheries um, the memo that had the hot potato reference in it? Sure. Bear and, with me. I'll pull it up. 
um, are we shared screen here? Um, Cause he even- That's the one. Oh, Department of Fish and Game. So it's Prince oh, it's... William Sound Regional Fisheries Planning Team. It would look like oh, it was Fish and Game and Pins So it's a planning team. So it could have been Fish and Game or, so do you, do you have the whole memo? We do, yeah. Right. Are you able to pull that up, Ewan? Yeah, I've got a, I've got the memo up, but it doesn't have, oh, actually, Ronald O. Skoog, Commissioner for the Division of Har uh, the Division of Harbour Design and Construction, it looks like. You know, that's On the all, left? Yeah, sorry, this, the, all the memos are in one PDF, so uh, I've, Scrolled on to no, the no next memo. It looks like there's no no uh, signatures to that one. It's just that one page. Okay. Uh, um, I can. No worries. If you have, if you have the old memo sometime, I'm just really curious who who wrote that. <laughs> Thanks, you and just give us a see I'm I'm getting it here. I've got it. This one? Yeah. Does it not have a mark? Is that all? It just cuts off and goes to a different uh let's see, 78 and then this is 79. So Okay, and I wonder I wonder if it's in Megan Marie's email. Did she email all those documents to us originally? I think she did. Oh I I could send her an email too to see if she if she has it, so. Yeah. Um, hard to find an email on EAC Lake Weir ownership because there are so many of them in my inbox. Um, yeah, it might be easier for me to search it on yeah. my desktop. Um, uh, mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I don't have anything else in the files here, Kate. I think it might just be cut off from where it was scanned in. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah, it doesn't have a... Yeah, even the file direct that. from her. Um, hmm. I'm going to ask her who... I'll ask her. All righty. Thanks for coming Thanks on, Steve. Good to yeah, see yeah. him. Yep, good presentation. Hopefully you get done. <laughs> and I hope so too. <laughs> Make this dream a reality. Well, thanks, you and I think we're done. No one's left. Our last fan is leaving. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kate. Hey. Uh, did, did you want a, I don't know, like a debrief tomorrow or do you just want to? Show me an email if nope, I you've uh, got time. <laughs> Fair enough. Not even going to think about it. Not that I don't like to visit with you, but I, I mean, I feel like it was fine. Like, I don't think that there is. I mean, I think we'll just stay in touch about what we hear from the students. And I feel like we had some big track, big steps today. So that she was taking with commissioners. So we'll see. Glad to hear it. Awesome. Right, I'll be in the. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll be where I am. So, uh, catch you later. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.